Hi, how are you guys? Good, how are you? Great, thank you so much for doing this. Of thank course. you so much for having us. Of course. Um, our podcast is all about your guys' journey in the music industry uh, and how you got to where you are today. Cool, we like that. <laughs> Sweet, so are you guys... You guys are obviously in two different places. <laughs> Which never happened. We are, yes. We're like connected at the hip, except for right now. Oh, really? <laughs> Sometimes you just, you, you know, you need a break. No. We, we're emotionally connected all the time. <laughs> the truth comes out. No, yeah, I'm upstate right now, and, um, and Rachel's in our loft, but um, this is a rare occurrence. So, you know, it might be a totally different interview. Than we normally give. Good, I like that. We'll, we'll have something different. Here. <laughs> right on. So up, you said upstate. Are you in New York? Upstate New York. I'm um in like outside of Woodstock in Bearsville. Just family. Yeah. Oh, okay. And are you guys originally from the, like the the East Coast, New York area? We're from Berkeley, California. Oh, Berkeley. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we came came a good good little ways. Um, yeah. I'm in, in San Diego, and I used to live in the Bay Area, so I know. Oh, cool. Where yeah. did you live? I lived um, a little bit in, I lived in, like, the Contra Costa County area, like, uh, Walnut Creek. Yeah. I lived there for a while. Um, yeah, mainly there, actually. Cool. Yeah. You know that well. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, very cool. So, um, okay, yeah, so it's all about your guys' journey in the music industry and how you got to where you are now. Uh, Gracie, tell me about uh, how you got into music. Ooh, um, I, well, I think I was, you know, like six or seven when I started asking for piano lessons and, and then, uh, had a family friend pass away and was moved to like, just write a song out of, out of that experience. And that was sort of how I started, started songwriting. Um, but started taking piano early on and just felt like it was something I wanted to, to explore, but I just, I had an attention seeking problem where I, I needed to be, you know, watched and performing was just something I wanted to do. I just wasn't sure exactly what facet, if that was, you know, in theater or um, in music, but I, I slowly started to get my voice when I was about 14 and yeah. And would you do like uh, recitals and? Yeah, you know. recitals and things like that. And um, just playing little open mics around town and I'd have my mom drive me to. And then when I met Rachel, I started forcing her to come with me to those so oh, okay <laughs> so Rachel how did you get into music so um I started playing violin I I think I should give credit to my brother because he played violin and obviously whatever he did I wanted to do too <laughs> um so yeah I I started playing violin when I was like six seven um and yeah, I kind of just moved through the classical paradigm for many, many years, um, going to conservatory, studying with, you know, on the weekends and um, through, through summers. It was a pretty rigorous, I would say, upbringing in mm -hmm. violin training. Um, and I still continue my classical, you know, I care about classical music a lot, mm -hmm. but... I think I was always interested in like, I would hear music on the radio and I'd be like, oh, those are such cool string arrangements. Like, I feel like I could do something like that. And I was really attracted to kind of getting outside of that classical bubble. And Gracie was really encouraging, supportive of bringing me into her world and kind of like taught me how to write for myself or like think for myself mm -hmm. from a melodic perspective, not just what's like given to you on the page. So. Sure. Wow. And so were you just only strictly playing classical and, and like stuff that other people had written and until you met, sorry, go ahead. Exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So like, how did, I think the first time we got together, I was like, okay, so what do I do? Like, <laughs> you know, I usually sit down for orchestra or I'm learning a, a concerto or something. It's just right there in front of you. So. And Gracie, you were doing the opposite. You were writing music yeah, I, and... <laughs> it's like very little structure. I mean, I took, you know, I had piano lessons and I, I was studying classical and jazz pieces, but um, not in the same way that Rachel was. And so meeting her was really grounding for me and was guiding because, you know, I had somebody who was expecting there to be 
a place to go. And I had to like, you know, kind of forge a confidence in that. And that was a, I think it was just, yeah, for both of us, a really big learning curve. And, and we kind of kept pushing each other in some different ways and, and keeping each other, holding each other accountable, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Cause it's some, sometimes like you guys are two, the two like opposite ends of like the music writing spectrum there, as far as like exactly. classical and, you know, reading sheet music and then just kind of writing your own songs. Yeah. Was that strange? Like, uh, Rachel, for you being on the very technical side, maybe music theory side, if, if, if Gracie was like, oh, this is a cool, like, you know, chord progression. And it was, it was ever like, oh, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, you know, almost like mathematically in the music <laughs> realm. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. <laughs> I think like theoretically I can be a little bit closed minded sometimes when it comes especially to harmony, but I like dissonant harmony, but again, I kind of want it to be like, it's like there's like a right dissonance and a wrong dissonance or something. You know, I, I do think I, I fall into these traps of like, there's a right way and a wrong way. And Gracie's like, let's do all the ways, you know? Like, <laughs> let's explore all It's funny you call it closed-minded because I feel like it was open-minded in the sense that like, I didn't know what harmonies to choose. I didn't have like a plan. And I mean, that was a cool thing in a lot of ways, but also it limited me because I couldn't, you know, get that sound sometimes that I, I knew I wanted. I just didn't always know how to get there. And so I think that that really opened, opened up a lot of things for us musically. And, and, and I loved that we were very much in sync as far as dissonant harmony. I think like we were always attracted to putting that little sour note at the end of a song or just something mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe didn't feel complete or resolved. And um, so we kind of evolved that a little bit together, I would say, just with our varying mm -hmm. approaches. And then how did, how well, how'd you meet originally and, and start playing together? We met in a high school dance class and uh, we were kind of like arranged marriage to work together on a song <laughs> for that class. And, um, and then, and then, you know, we're like, you know, a little bit reluctant to doing that because neither of us, I had written, you know, things, but by myself and I'd never done that with somebody else. And, you know, Rachel was newer to that process. And so we were kind of uncomfortable, I think, but it was a great thing that we were, we were kind of forced to do that because I, I don't know how much longer it might've taken us to get there on our own. And it was a good thing for our, for our blossoming, you know, mm -hmm. together. And so that was for a high school, a high school class you got put yeah. together and you had to yeah. write a song and perform it. Is that kind of what yeah. the or yeah, well, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we had to write a song together. I think it was called like Baby Steps, right, Gracie? <laughs> there was this dance, the teacher had like decided that the, the choreography for this class was gonna be like the evolution of, of human uh, kind. And so it was about like being, you know, you were crawling and it was like these baby steps oh, to sure. being, you know, an evolved dancing body. And so she had asked the class, like who were the musicians in the room? And we were the only two people that raised our hands and then ended up being, you know, told to, to write the music for the dance. And we were, oh, okay. we were pretty, pretty bummed because we wanted to dance. That's why we were in the class. And, you know, we had our own music classes outside of that. We were fine, but um, uh -huh. it ended up being a really beautiful accident. Yeah. You guys got to like almost score <laughs> the routine for, for yeah, for, and, and we played it to like a screaming theater of like 500 people, you know, at the end of the semester. So I think we, we started out with a really false sense of what the music industry would be like. It would just be this like amazing reception of just filled auditoriums all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it so, was a good start. Yeah. Well, after that class, obviously you guys kept, kept playing together. Um, when did you start writing music and you had already played out, right? Right, Gracie. And then so it'd be like, when did you guys join together to start playing out? I mean, playing out is a really nice um, exaggeration of what I was doing. I was just <laughs> playing open mics, you know, what? that I, yeah, I don't even think, I think my mom would have to come with me to a lot of them because I wasn't of age and there were, they were bars and you couldn't, you know, it was 21 or up. So she would just be there with me to like be a, you know, um, a, what do you call it? Supervisor. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was a really fun thing. And I got really into that. And there was this thing called the West Coast Songwriters. And, um, and then, you know, bringing Rachel in, we started actually winning. And that was really wow. Fun. So, um, yeah, that was fun. And we would just get kind of into going to as many as we could. And, and then when we went off to our separate colleges, it was, 
a long distance musical relationship where we would have rehearsals over video calls and fly home and play shows together. And that just got stronger over the years. And, and then we moved to New York. So it was a natural evolution. There wasn't really a, a set thing that happened, but it was just mm -hmm. getting a little more confidence to play and booking little shows at home and in each other's college towns and then moving to I New feel York. Like, I feel like that was kind of like our trial. Like we were feeling out if we mm -hmm. wanted to maybe commit to it um, while we were still, you know, studying at our prospective mm -hmm. schools. So it was like a nice in between, like, let's test it out sometimes, but we're not fully going for it. So, yeah. Yeah, we got lucky with some really great shows. Like Rachel booked a really cool one for us in Bloomington and a lot of, you know, wonderful people came out and it was a great show. And then I booked one in Boston and, and it was a it was a neat experience. So I think we just kind of started to feel like we could do this um, a little more confidently. Mm -hmm. what, what do you remember the moment when you're like, you know, what, we should just really just do this full time? <sighs> I honestly don't think we had the conversation. Yeah, that's kind of wild. <laughs> I think it was just like understood. Yeah, that's, it's, that's, it's, my, it's, that's it's, my perspective. It is interesting I talking about it and just being like, okay, where are we moving to? LA, yeah. London, or New York? I wonder if there was a conversation. I wish I could be a fly on the wall and listen to that. But yeah, you know, see, when you live this over intertwined life, you just really kind of the lines get so blurred, you forget where you begin and the other person and or where you end and they begin and mm -hmm. vice versa. And so, um, yeah, we just kind of had a gut guttural feeling, I'm sure, that just we didn't have to talk about it, which has been the root of a lot of things in our relationship. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> like, just like, hey, you know, we're, we're doing this. Like, we don't even yeah. need to talk about it. We just know yeah. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And where, what was the first song you guys uh, went in the studio, recorded, and, like, properly put out? Tiptoe? Well, yeah, properly put out. Tiptoe. We, what was it yeah probably tiptoe yeah we moved into this loft and we just we we moved in with our stuff and we thought we were just a piano violin duo and we had our producer friend come out to help us record there um garrett and he kind of he brought a he had a drum sitting in his car that he needed to bring in um because mm -hmm. he didn't want to leave it in the car and i just remember us being like okay well we're never going to use that but that's fine we'll keep it here and then of course it got naturally in integrated into the tracks and and there was a first song you know tiptoe that was sort of about our experiences as you know two musicians um coming to new york and trying to tiptoe our way in and um and that was something that then came out later when we you know got our team together and mm -hmm. yeah How did, yeah tell me about forming your team and and, and like how, when stuff starts kind of really rolling for you yeah i mean we put out a record, which we don't talk about a lot, but um, we put out our own like set of 10 songs. Was it 10? Mm. <clears throat> and then yeah. and we made them ourselves and we were really proud right when we moved to New York, you know, we spent the first year or so doing that. And then, and then we like, we're sending it out to people and trying to get more traction with it. And that, that, that's how we reached our management company that we still have today. And, and they, I remember them just like calling us and being like, look, we're interested, but only if you like take this back and take it down and you know kind of we'll redo it and we'll put it back out you know properly you know oh uh, sure so that was like emotionally stunting for us because we had just spent the first you know little while in new york working on this music and then to you know, we're so grateful to have a team that was going to help us you know really do this the right way but we had to then kind of put the same songs back out and rework them or reimagine them and you know we were wanting to move on a little bit from those songs um, right so. It, but it was it was a good problem to have because we were able to really do it you know without just reaching our 300 friends and family we could reach you know a few a few more people out there sure that. so you okay so those the 10 songs they liked it they just wanted you guys to re-record them yeah i think they wanted to put them out i think they liked too. most of them <laughs> yeah they did okay. cut one. <laughs> they did cut i think two yeah, we just found we found the CD the other day, and we were like, "Oh my goodness, that song was a forgotten song." But yeah, they liked most of it, and they just wanted to ramp up the, I think, the production and the spirit behind it, and not just have it be a piano, violin, and a drum, and in, in you know, in a loft. I think mm -hmm. they wanted to, they wanted us to take it to the studio and and evolve things there, and we're really grateful for that. It, and then we got a couple more songs that we hadn't even written before um, that time in, and that made the record that I think became kind of leading songs for us so um yeah 
Yeah. yeah. Well, so, was it, um, how was it approaching those songs again for the second time in the studio? Was it, was it weird to try to build on what you had already, you know, put out and done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you kind of get, it's like demo syndrome where you're just sort of like, you become very attached to these early, you know, sounds or articulate the way you articulated something. And so having to like take it back sometimes I think was challenging, but it was also mm -hmm. really, I think it was a good learning experience for us to go into a studio and work with different producers and see how they worked and how we could, you know, ultimately learn how to do that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And was that first record, like when you met your management and, your, and that first record, was that put out on Righteous Babe also, or is that new, a new label for you guys? Brand new. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. Okay, well, yeah, we'll get to there. <laughs> so you had the full length out, um, the management, and then did you guys go on a tour or did you do anything many, to support the record? Many. Yeah, we did some good tours um, off the bat. It was great. We, we got some good touring um, following the release of the record. And then after, after the record was out, we were really like able to stay out on the road and um, and go on tour with with Ani DeFranco and meet her crew of people and play her Babe Fest, and that's sort of how we got into the the world of Righteous Babe and and um, putting the record out um, this time around. It's just a really memorable moment from putting the record out because we had waited for so long, you know, and it was like, oh great, we're finally arrived, and we've been talking <laughs> about the music for so long, like. For, for us to get a tiny desk was, was very oh, yeah. rewarding. And I think we both were just like, oh my gosh, it's great. You know, we were very moved. So that happened pretty, fairly quickly after we released the record, right? Yeah, I think I think it was like a week or something after that we got invited yeah. and we were like, okay, great. This this will be good for us just, you know, getting to be in the live experience right after a record comes out, which is something we're, we're reminiscing on it and mourning right now, um, but you know it's 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 a new time and and yeah wow yeah i mean everyone's played like all the major major artists have done the tiny desk concerts and i love them and that must have been such a cool experience to to be you know at that little you know yeah. where they do it and just having that that exposure yeah. terrifying was it, and it was wonderful terrifying. it was <laughs> do they how do they do it can you is it just like okay there's We're going to film you for 20 minutes and that's it. It's like a vortex of black and you walk through and then you're just at this desk. No, it's like a regular, <laughs> a regular office. It's just, it's pretty amazing. You go up in the NPR offices and then you round the corner to what you think will be just another cubicle. And, and it is another cubicle. It just has mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff all over it. And, and then, you know, you recognize all the, all the things around it and yeah but it's just just really like in an office and they're filming a few cameras and wonderful sound guy josh rogason and bob's there and it's just a really intimate experience just as i think it you know translates um for, for mm -hmm. somebody but yeah it's very stripped down for us and it was it was it was scary you know you it's very raw and mm -hmm. um we and like is it live or do that you do you do like one song and you can kind of because you there's like an is there an audience there yeah 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 they they do the big you know npr loudspeakers to ever all the uh the different categories of npr folks you know there uh -huh. they're like come on down to the tiny desk gracie and rachel you know oh cool it kind of feels like a school like auditorium where they're like all right everybody yeah. report to the assembly room you know <laughs> sure and then, and then people show up and you're like whoa there's like 50 people here now or whatever it like fills up and that's nice um to have a crowd there so it feels a little more human but you don't stop it's just three songs or whatever however many songs it is in a row and that's yeah. what it is there's no like do over um it's just, right yeah because it's just one long take right yeah. at least when you watch but there's multiple camera angles so that's yeah, what i was wondering cameras. If, yeah. if you guys got a chance to stop and be like, okay, we're going to take it. But wow, no. it's just like a, a show. And, yeah. And then that's it. That's, that's why it was so terrifying lately. Like as we've been doing live streams or like pre, we do pre-recorded stuff for, for socials and things that mm -hmm. people want with publications. And like 
we've been just talking about how much more terrifying that process is than the live show when you're you know on the road and it, it's similar to tiny desk because it is going to be just stuck in stone whatever you do there right Whereas when you're live you know you can just breathe through it and flow through it and um but there's something kind of terrifying about having to you know just record that and then that's it you know yeah it's like one shot and then it lives there forever yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I've, I'm pretty much every artist I've interviewed during this uh, COVID quarantine that ha talks about doing the live streams are always like, I'd rather play a stadium to like 100,000 people than, you know, go live on Instagram or whatever. Just because yeah, well, that doesn't sound bad. Stadium to 100,000. <laughs> but I meant like as far as like yeah. nerve wracking experience. <laughs> like... Yeah, it is. Really, it's isolating and, and, and awkward, but you know. Yeah, and then trying to like respond to people, you know, commenting and, and all yeah. that. I can imagine that gets a little uh, hectic. <laughs> yeah, the banter can be quite dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, okay, so you guys put out that self-titled record. You um, you played the Tiny Desk concert. You got to, t how did you get the, the Ani DeFranco tour? Babe, was, yeah, invited to play her Babe Fest, which is like a lineup of uh various artists that they have so it wasn't like a direct support or anything we were just included in that lineup and um mm. she got to see our set that night and then it, uh get to know each other a little bit and she invited us to open three shows and then those three shows went well and we got to open some longer tours so kind of a natural evolution there yeah that's awesome and then obviously uh she likes you enough to she, they're putting out your record it's coming out yeah and hopefully she still likes us after we put the record up <laughs> I'm sure she will <laughs> um that's cool so so you just you made a deal with her and said hey you know we, we want to put a record out and she she wanted to sign you guys to righteous bay yeah right righteous babe she she's super supportive of just i think women putting out and and men but just and all all kinds of people but just people mm -hmm. that want to have control over their art and she was such an in influence to us on the road um learning to you know just take ownership of what's you know what we're putting out there and um so it felt like a really natural fit yeah i mean that record label is such a grassroots um uh, model because she just started it you know on her own when she was 20 and huge very, very inspiring yeah yeah to totally and like it's it's amazing like what she's built up with it and you guys have a the record's coming out next month it's it's ready for pre-order now right um there is and tell me tell me about this album and the differences between putting this out now and uh the first record the self-titled when we obviously weren't in the pandemic and <laughs> and everything yeah i mean rachel maybe you can talk about it a little bit but um i mean we haven't put it out yet so we'll say that Mm -hmm. We don't know yet what it's going to uh, feel like. Oh, sure. Yeah. But as far as like the writing and recording of the album, was it different? Yeah, I think there was, there were different, I think a lot of those the, the songs on the first record, I think maybe we wrote separately we'll, or Gracie would write a song and bring it to me and then we would, you know, turn it into something else and living together through the making of this second record, I, I think it lent itself to a lot of different creative approaches. Mm -hmm. um, we were living yeah. together the whole time, but I, I think that Rachel got really more into like production this time around and, and creating sound worlds. Um, I think that came from some experiences of us you know, working with people that we felt like were deciding our sound, you know, deciding how we should sound um, more than than maybe we wanted them to. And so I think, um, you know, Rachel took a really big deep dive into learning how to produce um, for us. And, and that really helped us, you know, be able to flesh out demos, at, you know, in the incubation stage um, on our own terms before bringing them to other people. Um, and having them, you know, then elevate things. We still worked with so many wonderful producers and um, people, Ariel Lowe, and, um, but we just, yeah, wanted to, I think, have a little more control at the onset um, than we did the last time around. So that's been a really liberating thing. Mm -hmm. but, and you know, because we were living in such close quarters, I think there's like a lot of themes about communication um, that exist on the record, just sort of helping us even navigate our own relationship together in this mm -hmm. 
case. So I think that's definitely um, apparent on this record. And were you guys demoing it in that that uh, room you're sitting in there, uh, mm -hmm. Rachel? <laughs> wow, yes. that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Very it's an cool. easy, easy commute to the office from the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> and well, like, were you guys on the road at all when, um, when the quarantine hit? No, we weren't. Okay. We were just, we were just about to go back out there. So like we had been hibernating writing this record. We've been saying like in a chosen isolation for the past year and a half. And then we were about to come out and go, you know, hopefully go back out on the road. And then we were told to get right back inside so it's been kind of an extension of our own quarantine this this time you know right mm -hmm. now um but we're glad that other people are you know doing it with us now that's one sense of relief that we're all we're all in this little weird world together um sure. but hopefully we can come out out of it in some helpful ways yeah. yeah have you guys been writing like new material while we're stuck inside a little bit. We're mostly focusing on visuals and music videos. We've been really working on kind of getting um, some other thing. You know, we had some videos that were done, you know, prior to, you know, the singles, of course, coming out. But we also mm -hmm. had some plans for music videos that couldn't happen. We had, you know, a shootout in Joshua Tree that couldn't happen because we, you know, had to cancel. So like, but it kind of pushed us to get some other things that I think we're, we're really excited about um, and, and just getting different kinds of thinking behind how to be creative during this time. Um, so that's been, that's been good. But we've got, we've got a lot of B-sides that will be coming out too. Cause again, we spent like a year and a half writing, writing and this record, we wrote a lot of songs that didn't make the record. Um, so we, we we're excited to share those in some other ways. Amazing. Can't wait to, can't wait to hear the record and, 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 and when it comes out and obviously hopefully soon enough, you'll be able to, to tour the album and, you know, see people and, and, and everything else. But thank yeah. you guys so much for, for chatting and hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having us. Yeah. I have, for what you do. Thank you. I have one more question. I want to see if I can get an answer from each of you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. I think I would just say get lost and be be good with that. Um, I think that we often try to find, you know, a route that we're comfortable with, but, you know, getting lost gets us to places we might not otherwise get to. And then my other piece that I've just been saying a lot through this process is to write ugly and edit pretty. And I think that that just means like, you know, being able to throw things out and not be too precious about how they, you know, are coming out or not editing at the onset, just like, you know, splattering it out there and then worrying about making it pretty later. It's kind of my thing. Yeah. That's good, Gracie. I, I, I've now taken that advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I feel, I just feel like it's a big, you should just be patient with yourself and um, really like be okay with the parts that are hard and difficult and, you know, what may be perceived as failures are, you know, just all part of the process. Um, and um, what, and yeah, that's about it. I think that's good. <laughs> that's good. I like Love that. it. It's, it really, really caps in our title, you know, finding, being cool with your failures is just hello weakness, you make me strong, out September 18th on Righteous Babe. Bring me the best word.